Okay, and the third speaker is Markus Frug uh, from uh, Leipzig University, uh, and he will talk about invariant observables in quantum gravity and gravitational loop corrections, the Newtonian potential. Please start. Thank you very much. You can hear me. Wonderful. Uh, I only have a short amount of time, so let's not waste time with any introductions. Um, I'm doing perturbative quantum gravity. Uh, I'm not an algebraic quantum field theorist yet, but Kasha is trying to convince me to become Oh, fully to the mathematician side, anyway. Come to the dark side. Yes. Do you have cookies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you all know what we do. We take our metric, put a background, some perturbations, quantize the perturbations. Uh, the perturbation parameter is uh, kappa, square root of the Newton's constant, with c equal h bar equal 1. So it's very small, Planck length, uh, essentially. So it's a very good perturbation theory. Uh, we also have symmetry, so it's a gauge, symmet uh, gauge theory. Uh, symmetries are infinitesimal diffeomorphisms. They work like that. Uh, particular gauge transformation of the metric perturbation is the well-known symmetrized uh, derivative of the uh, gauge parameter plus higher order corrections. And uh, then it's known, well, I put here a reference of Burgess, but there's an older review by Donahue, that the usual methods of quantum field theory and curved space-time uh, can be applied to that, and you can make predictions. Uh, and those predictions, they are valid at length scales larger than the fundamental scale, which in this case is the Planck length, or if you want that energy scales below that scale. Yeah? So this is it's a very, uh, say, maybe naive approach, but uh, it's like Newtonian gravity and Einstein gravity. The predictions here are valid at uh, appropriate scales, and any fundamental theory in the appropriate limit must give the same predictions. So I think it's worthwhile studying. Uh, okay, yeah, it's extremely efficient, I said that. It's a very good perturbation theory. In fact, it's so good that only the tree level predictions can be experimentally verified. Right? The CMB, that's the CMB spectrum. Uh, and as we've heard, well, uh, many talks, the main issue, or one of the main issues, is the construction of observables. Because uh, the gauge symmetry is uh, very different from the usual ones. And we all know young mill series, uh, so that's an internal gauge symmetry. That means it acts on the field variables at any given point. So, for example, uh, then you can take things like the trace of f squared, so f a mu nu, f a mu nu. That's the gauge invariant quantity at one single point. And then when compute these things, there's a mathematical theory behind that, cohomology theory, it's very nice. Uh, but in quantum gravity, perturbative, you can also remove the quantum, uh, gauge symmetry is something very different. They are diffeomorphisms, or infinitesimal diffeomorphisms, if it's perturbative, and those move points. So any field at a fixed point can, by, by definition, essentially not be gauge invariant, and uh, that means that there are no local observables, yeah, with, of course, always exceptions to the rule, but this is sort of the uh, main message, and the question is, okay, so the exception are linear order things, uh, at higher orders, one can think of stuff. We've heard of many things uh, for observables. Uh, so you can average quantities. You can look at things at fixed geodesic distance and average those. You can look at the S matrix. That's, of course, a very well-known non-local observable. It connects the past, infinite past with the infinite future. Uh, but of course, on the other hand, we can make local measurements. Yeah? If I would drop this now, it would fall down. That would be a measurement. Uh, so the question is, how can you reconcile this with the non-locality of observables? And uh, the answer is, well, we've heard this already, but let me emphasize the point again. Uh, what we actually do is we make relational measurements. Yeah, we always look at the state of one field with respect to another field. So, for example, uh, that point with respect to the floor. And, uh, yeah, gravity with respect to matter, for example. Yeah. And now the question is just, uh, can we make this uh, nice and precise? And uh, yes, we can do. We've heard the talk, uh, of course, on this. Uh, Relational observables. Kasha told us this morning in a very mathematical way how to construct these. So maybe for physicists such as me, I need a more pedestrian way. That's a pedestrian way. We take n scalar fields. So if we're in n dimensions, if we're in four dimensions, we take four. Uh, they can depend on the field contents, so on the metric, matter fields, whatever you have. And they should transform as scalars under diffeomorphisms. Yeah, I'm perturbative, so I also take a background. I expand my function whatever I have in perturbation theory. I invert that, so then I get x0 as a function of x, and if x transforms as a scalar, that transforms inversely to a scalar. So now I can just compose, I evaluate my field A that I want to measure at the position x0 and hold the capital X fixed. And this is something relational. Yeah? Uh, the x mu that are defined in that way, uh, they are field dependent coordinates, and A of chi, that's the value of A at that point where the chi is equal to capital X. Yeah, and then evaluating at x0, it's a field on the background, uh, these relational observables, of course, uh, they can be used in all formalisms, also more fundamental things. Uh, okay, so these ones I'm, say, uh, not totally unfamiliar with, so that's why I put them, but I refer to you to the nice talk by Philip on Tuesday, who has a more complete picture and also more names. Sorry if, if I forgot anyone, I certainly forgot many people. Okay, uh, 
So what can you do? Well, as Kasha said, one can choose some curvature scalars, some scalar fields. But there's a problem, because if you have a highly symmetric background, like Minkowski or the sitter space, you don't discriminate the points. If you add some scalars, you change your theory. And then, uh, well, some people have said that the algebraic approach is, uh, doesn't add anything new. I think Rudy is somewhere in the audience. Uh, but that's not true. So if you look at that very nice paper, many people paper, they had an idea on how to actually do these things to all orders and perturbation theory. And I think, well, in my opinion, that was really a breakthrough. Uh, Dirichlet proposal has some issues, but those can be fixed. Uh, you can look at the papers. Uh, and what happens is that the observables that you get in this way, they're very nice. They are non-local, because they must be. But the non-locality is restricted to the past light cone. Uh, so they involve in a nice uh, microcausal fashion, you could say. Uh, they fulfill all the nice things that you want in a perturbative theory. Non-perturbative, we have no idea. OK, and then one can use them to do computations. So this is the second part of my talk. I'm still fine on time. Very good. Uh, so one can use the relational framework to define an invariant metric perturbation. So it's the first order, it's just the usual one, plus and then the symmetrized the derivative of the first order coordinate corrections. And then one can really check, I mean, uh, compute the variation of that from the metric perturbation. You get the symmetrized the derivative of the gauge parameter, and the axis should transform as a scalar. So to lowest order, it gives another xi, and it just cancels. Yeah. By construction, of course, it works to all orders. Uh, and then, well, invariant Newtonian gravitational potential, I just define it as in classical GR, minus one half the time time component of that thing. Expectation value because I'm in quantum theory. And now I can compute things. I said we need gravity plus matter. So for the matter, we take a point particle, yeah, just something that is here. And we compute the H00 in the theory, which has uh, action of that plus gravity action. OK, there's some einbein, whatever. Uh, it has some additional symmetry, so one needs to be a bit careful with that. BST formalism is helpful. Uh, and what we want is we want the corrections due to graviton loops. But of course, this is a quantum particle, yeah? It's when it, it fluctuates. So what uh, we have to do is we take a large mass expansion. If something's heavy, it should not fluctuate. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, not completely successful, but, uh, well, one can try. So position of the particle, it's just, uh, well, it sits at one point yeah, at the center, just evolves in time, and then there's some fluctuations, and OK, the iron band also fluctuates. <coughs> Whatever. Uh, one can use QFT. There are many, many diagrams. There are graviton and ghost loops. There are world line corrections. So those involve uh, these fluctuations y here. There are classical corrections, and there are corrections from the x mu. Now, the nice thing is we have something gauge invariant. Uh, so we can use any gauge. And the nice gauge is one that uh, kills you half of the diagrams, because then it's half of the work. Uh, we compute the classical correction that agrees with the expansion of the Schwarzschild metric in harmonic coordinates. So that's a very good check on the result. Yeah, that's what we should get. And then we get a quantum corrected potential. Uh, so what we have, classical potential. Yeah, uh, This is the classical correction at second order. And then there are two different quantum contributions. Uh, first one is this. So by dimensional reasons, they always must come with a factor of h bar g over r squared. There's no other possibility in flat space. So the only non-trivial thing is the coefficient. And this first one here, this 41 over 10 pi, that agrees with the results uh, derived using the inverse scattering method, where you look at scattering of two scalar particles in flat space, compute the S-matrix element, and then check which potential gives you the same element, same S-matrix element. So this is this universal factor. Uh, so just for reference, uh, this factor, well, there are various groups, various people, took 10 years to get right. Uh, this was a master's student, so <laughs> just for comparison. And then we have a second term. And this second term is, uh, well, I tried. We wanted to suppress particle fluctuations, but we didn't manage. Yeah? So there's no way to suppress completely the fluctuations of that particle itself. And the second term comes exactly from the fluctuations of the world line of the heavy particle that we look at. Okay. So it's remnant of a uh, zitter bewegung at uh, Dirac theory. Uh, and you can find, well, many more, and that's the reference. So that's the good master student. Uh, OK, uh, this is what it looks like, basically exaggerated, of course. So uh, it dips down a bit more below. So you can say, OK, what does it mean? It means that the gravitational force is strengthened by quantum corrections at small distances. Uh, the potential is lower. Or if you see this as, a, say, corrections to a black hole, then you can say, well, the horizon is where the potential uh, passes 0. So the horizon radius decreases a bit. Uh, but OK, it is microscopic. No, no way to actually measure that in any sensible way. Um, and then I still have some time, wonderful. So I can also come to meta loop corrections. Uh, so this was all, sorry, this was all flat space. Yeah, so there's basically nothing that you can get except some coefficient Planck length squared over R squared. But if you go to a better background, like the sitter, this 
what I did as well, the sitter space, you can get other corrections. And those corrections are actually exciting. Um, gravitons in the sitter are very hard. Uh, Richard Wooders has already departed, so I can't give him the task of computing them. Uh, but uh, can do meta loop corrections. And the meta loop corrections, they are a bit easier. Uh, this is, yeah, it's actually a bit something previously. And we took conformal meta just for simplicity. Of course, then computations are nice and easy. Uh, and you see, so again, there's some term that goes like Planck length squared over R squared. Uh, so actually a physical distance, that's the one that you want. But then there's another term here, and what I want to draw attention to is this very last term, it's the log R. So this is something that, unlike those terms, does not decrease at large distances, it goes. Yeah, it's an effect that, if you're sufficiently far away from the particle, actually could be measurable. Not in practice, unfortunately, but in principle. And uh, one can also generalize this to spinning particles. Then you get corrections through gravitomagnetic potential, the zero i part. And again, there are some logarithmically growing terms. So now, the good thing would be if one would have uh, I don't know, an infinite number of master students, put each one of them at one loop order higher, and generalize this to all loop orders, and then think about, so what are the leading corrections? Uh, could it be that one could resum them to get some different fall off behavior of r, like not one over r, but one over r to the one half, yeah, and then maybe explain mod from first principles uh, if you're into that. Okay, so that's it, I think. I'm fine on time, wonderful. Uh, we have the issue of gauge and observables. So I think that's a central theme to all approaches in quantum gravity. So it, and it can connect the perturbative thing with fundamental approaches, whatever you like. Observables, they are non local, I mean, necessarily, uh, but one can compute relation observables and, in fact, to all orders. And the results. Uh, one can use them to compute things, so we get very nice results. We get the strengthening of the gravitational force. Yeah, that was the picture I showed. Uh, we get logarithmically growing corrections to the Newtonian and gravitomagnetic potential in the sitter space, you know, something that maybe could have observable consequences. Uh, there's other work, so I can look, for example, at corrections to the Hubble rate that measures the expansion of the universe. You get some secular screening, so it goes down. And whatever else you like, the theory is there, so you can now start computing. I invite you to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, right on time. And now, questions. <laughs> yes, please. Um, do you know under what circumstances your relational coordinates are globally defined and actually give you a good coordinate system? I mean, for example, do, do you, don't you ever get caustics or uh, are, right. can you continue the evolution indefinitely into mm -hmm. the future? Issues like that. Uh, that's a good question. So um, the issues don't arise here because I'm really strictly perturbative. So I'm always assuming that any corrections are vastly smaller than whatever background structure I have. Um, of course, it depends on what exactly are the coordinates that you choose. So I think there are some uh, which are better suited to avoid such problems of caustics and so on. But this is really strictly perturbative. Just a, a clarification uh, mm -hmm. question. You mentioned this 43 over 10 that reproduces the, the, the usual results of 41. Mm -hmm. But then you said there's another contribution. Mm -hmm. that So this one is, can you explain? It, it, it was not expected or it comes from the... Uh, the coordinate fluctuating? I missed exactly what. Yes, yes. Was the uh, so this okay. one comes, so this one is the gravitational vacuum polarization. So this comes from loops of gravitons and ghosts and whatever. And these ones are fluctuations of that body that I'm looking at. So. It's a different situation. So the previous calculations, uh, Donahue, Hriplovich, uh, Kirillin, what they do is they scatter scalar fields. So it's a completely different thing. Uh, and in fact, uh, I would not have been surprised if the result would have been completely different. But it's a different physical situation. So you really get one body and then polarization, and they looked at scattering things. But it turns out that actually the result is universal. Yeah, one, one of them. OK, let's move to the last question. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to point out that the gravitationally based relational observables you've been discussing are equivalent to the uh, gravitational dressing construction, first of all. And secondly, uh, though, when you solve the conditions to get the uh, 
say, dressed observables. In the harmonic case, uh, basically, uh, I think you're dropping a boundary term. And because of that, they don't satisfy the diff invariance conditions under harmonic diffeomorphisms. When you add that boundary term back in, then they aren't as local as I think you've said. Right. So, uh, I mean, we had to talk by Philip Hearn on Tuesday, who was connecting all these different approaches. And I mean, he was also pointing out that uh, this is, well, okay. uh, that one can reformulate this in a, in a language of dressed observables. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing I would not agree. So these things transform as they do under localized diffeomorphisms. I'm not saying anything about the structure at infinity. Loc there are no localized harmonic diffeomorphisms, so then the question doesn't arise. But yeah. OK, well let's postpone further discussions to the coffee break. And uh, I would like to invite the next speaker. Thank you very much.